Pues bienvenidos a todos al CCB. Es un gusto tener aquí a Etienne Turpin, un filósofo fundador de Annexat Office, oficina para la investigación de diseño con sedes en Yakarta y Berlín, y coordinador de investigación de User Group Inc., cooperativa ubicada en Londres que diseña softwares de respuesta a desastres y monitoreo del medio ambiente. Junto a Anna Sophie Springer, Turpen es co-investigador de Reassembling the Natural, su investigación basada en la exposición sobre las historias naturales del antropoceno y coeditor de Intercalations, Paginated Exhibition. Ha trabajado como investigador en diversos centros, tales como el Instituto de Tecnologías de Massachusetts, MIT, el Centro de Estudios del Sudeste Asiático de la Universidad de Michigan y el Centro Australiano para la Investigación Ambiental y Cultural de la Universidad de Wollongong. Ha impartido clases de investigación de diseño en las universidades de Toronto, Michigan, la Universidad de California, Berkeley y el Instituto Strelka de Medios, Arquitectura y Diseño en Moscú. Asimismo, es coeditor de Fantasies of the Library, MIT Press 2016, Art in the Anthropocene, Open Humanities Press de 2015 y Jakarta, Architecture Adaptation de 2013 y editor de Architecture in the Anthropocene, también de 2013. Esta es una plática que organizamos con el Laboratorio para la Ciudad, y pues ambas cosas son gusto, Turpin y Gabriela que vendrá después. Adelante. Um, and it's it's really nice to be here, and thank you to Gabriela for, for bringing me back. Um, so I'm going to talk. Uh -huh. Super. Wow, you guys really have it pretty dialed here. It's lovely to see. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few projects that are related to software in the city. And then I'm hoping that in our conversation, we can maybe geolocate those projects into a conversation about this part of the world where I've only been once before, uh, following uh, uh, last year in the earthquake. We were part of a conversation uh, with Gabriela in December last year. And it, it's very uh, interesting to be back. And I'm very grateful for, for you guys for hosting this conversation. Um, on the 18th of September. Um, so as I was preparing, uh, I noticed that uh, apparently people here in Mexico City like Twitter as much as people in Indonesia because there was like lots of, lots of action about, uh, about the lecture, which felt exciting. Um, but I also happened to notice um, that a thinker who is very important in my work and in our work in the office uh, passed away today. So I thought uh, just to uh, give a, a sign of respect uh, for Murillo, whose work uh, has been uh, absolutely fundamental in our project. Um, uh, uh, to begin with this passage, I'm not sure if you can see. I don't have so many quotes, so it won't be too bad. But. Uh, in the information bomb uh, published in 2005, which I believe were still living in the context of that bomb, uh, Virilio wrote, digital messages and images matter less than their instantaneous delivery. The shock effect always wins out over the consideration of the informational content. And thinking about the relationship between form and content in terms of information it is really something I want to uh, push through in, in the conversation and, and hopefully in this lecture uh, because I think rethinking this question of the, of the instantaneous is fundamental for the politics of the city uh, to come. So I'm going to do five parts. Some are longer than others. Uh, some are perhaps more narrative some more theoretical, but I try to do this in 40 minutes and then we have a conversation. Um, 
so just before uh, we arrived in this room this afternoon, uh, Marcella and I, uh, somewhere here maybe, had a conversation about uh, living on Mars uh, with respect to the MarsArchive.org project, which was quite fascinating and now thinking about it since, since that time. And she asked me at the beginning of that conversation to characterize the Anthropocene for any of you who might have checked out some of our work, you'll notice that that term appears a lot. I'm, I have no idea of its prevalence uh, here in Mexico City, but um, certainly within a number of academic, activist, and artistic discourses, it seems to be proliferating quite expeditiously. I put the term this Anthropocene because I want to instantiate where that happens as opposed to treating it as a universal way of reading human impact on Earth that in each uh, geology and geography and urbanism we can discover an instantiated Anthropocene uh, that allows a multiplicity of ways of understanding human impact, the inequalities that produce it, and the possibilities for changing it. But um, I do appreciate, I, I, I had misremembered that Rio de Janeiro was on this list and not Mexico City, so I was quite excited about this passage. But from Jan Zalasiewicz uh, and colleagues uh, from the Anthropocene Working Group in their 2011 publication, they write that cities, especially megacities like Jakarta, Rio de Janeiro, or Shanghai, are now the most visible expression of human influence on the planet. The growth of cities is therefore a characteristic feature of the Anthropocene. Now, conveniently, that name Jakarta, uh, we also do work in a number of other places, but I want to begin there uh, because I think it helps us understand some of the colonial history of climate change, which is important for situating our practice. So this is a map, I don't know, do you think it would be possible to turn the spotlight off of me a little so that the screen was more important than I was? Is there any chance of that? Okay. Just because I, I'm going to read a few of these images rather closely and I think it will be um, much more interesting for you to see them than to see me. So, yeah, great, fun time. Okay, so this is a, a 1667 map of the city of Batavia, which is uh, contemporary Jakarta. This was produced by the Dutch East Indies Company. And what you can see in this map is an amazing canalization, channelization as well, of what is called the Chiliwang River, which runs through the middle of that image. And what you're seeing in the late 17th century is the fortification of the most important colonial output, uh, outpost of Europe in the most important uh, site for the VOC, the, the island of Java, specifically the city of Batavia. And so why do the Dutch need to channelize all of the city? Importantly, and this many of you I think will he find a resonance with the urbanism of, of, of Mexico City, but for different reasons. Um, and here you can see by the 18th century, again, the, the channelization is increasing. The, the significance of controlling all of the various rivers which run through the settlement is important because Jakarta, unlike the Netherlands, has a monsoon season. And that monsoon season produces a level of rainfall intensity, which made it impossible for colonial traders to continue the practice of trade. And so here we see into the early 18th century, uh, a whole series of images uh, excitedly describing the various colonial products passing through the city of Batavia on their way to the Netherlands. But what becomes quite important to understand is that in 2000, 18, this is an image of the city of Jakarta on the bottom left, a city with now a population of 35 million residents who live among the 13 rivers, all of the legacy of the colonial infrastructure and the water management that was designed to enable commerce to run year-round 
without being interrupted by the monsoon, but that in a way is path dependent. None of the people who live in this city now can make decisions about where those canals were built, the efficacy of their design, or in any way the ways in which the city now must contend with the storm systems and the infrastructure that they have as a legacy of that colonial weather management project. And so according to Isle Weissman in a book um, titled The Conflict Shoreline, if, if we understand the management of seasonal nature as a colonial project, then we also understand that climate change is not the collateral damage of colonization, but its objective. And so the, with the objective of making the seasons irrelevant to capital accumulation, the Dutch effectively create a condition in which, as we can see from 76, 89, just before the fall of Suharto to 2014, this absolute explosion uh, in the Bay of Jakarta, the red here being vegetation and the green inverted as urban hardscape. And what, what we can start to understand is the inheritance of all of those forms of infrastructure and the colonial types of relationship with the river make the city subject to a whole series of inheritances that maybe aren't so productive. And so this is the city center. Um, this is essentially the central business district circle, uh, the independence uh, monument, a uh, welcome monument in the middle of this fountain, which normally has water on the inside and, and traffic on the outside. And you can see here that the whole city is completely inundated uh, as a result of infrastructure failure during the monsoon. So when we talk about Anthropocene problems or Anthropocene anxieties, I, I like to say that they're not matters of, of quantity of just counting stuff up, but they're also matters of intensity. And so if you have 100 centimeters of rainfall in one 24-hour period, that's a lot of rain and the infrastructure has to respond to it. If you have 100 centimeters of rainfall fall in one hour, the intensification of weather systems under, as a result of climate change means that infrastructure is simply under a level of pressure, intensity, that it can no longer contain. And so this is what happens when that level of intensity just blows pieces of infrastructure into oblivion. They disappear, and water then replaces every hole that, that was produced in them. But uh, this is 2013, and uh, one of the really significant things is that um, the treasury is just outside of the frame of this image. And that means that the money in the treasury got wet. And so one of the things that's intolerable to our contemporary society is that money be in any way inconvenienced by climate change. And so to respond to the inability of infrastructure to contain the intensities of climate change, the Indonesian government at the national and and the at the national level and the city at uh, the, the the city level initiated a project under the remarkable title normalization. And um, normalization, and I'm just going to frame this out quickly because I, I think it's quite important to understand when we say climate change has a colonial history that coloniality is continuing in the contemporary urban environment with new names. And so normalization is a process that says the rivers in Jakarta overflow during the monsoon. Here's a normal river upstream entering the city. And so in order to teach those rivers how to behave in a contemporary Anthropocene urban context, they will be normalized, which is to say they'll be a lot less like rivers and a lot more like canals or sewer systems. And so if we move from this condition and shear off the banks of the river, because those are no longer very useful, um, and replace them with a series of concrete embankments, um, 
by, by way of fortifying a relationship of the city will be on one side, the river will be on the other, and in this way we will never have to have the two interact. In fact, reaching a level of kind of absurdity in its practice of just shearing all of the houses along the river in half, here we can see still residents living inside them, um, wondering perhaps how far this madness will go. Um, and then here we see um, all of these um, concrete strips, which are essentially put into harnesses and pounded in along the, the entire edge of the river. Our estimate of this is approximately 125,000 transport loads of concrete in order to channelize one of the 13 rooms. Um, in order to produce what I think from this image we could say probably the left bank seems a little more um, hospitable. Um, and if we kind of zoom into that a little more closely, essentially what we have is an urban condition of a absolute dis separation, a complete and total cut between the city as it is contained in these residential buildings uh, and, and the river as it's essentially turned into a giant urban sewer. Now normalization also didn't just apply to the river, but all of the residents living alongside of it, many of whom were then relocated into these low-rise, low-cost um, buildings a, a long way from where they're working uh, and previously living. And so into that condition, in, into that madness of saying, while there's an inordinate number of opportunities for stewardship, for revival, for revitalization of the river with a number of organizations advocating for a much closer relationship between the river as an urban resident and the rest of the human residents, uh, the government sort of plugged away at, at trying to build this as fast as they can. Um, and, and in this we come to the third part of the talk of how might software as urban infrastructure uh, design for a city yet to come, which is to say a city that would recognize non-human entities like rivers and others uh, as, as residents deserving of attention in the same way as the human residents. Now, I know when we mention software these days, a lot of people think of uh, one particular person who I just want to remind you made this comment about you uh, not so long ago. Um, and, and so I think when we read things like uh, Zuck telling us that we're all dumb fucks and that in fact trusting the systems that we give so much information to is a completely naive position. Um, we, we can take that at face value. Uh, but we try to utilize a little different relationship, um, and that's a very simple question that comes from the work of Abdumalik Simon, a very important uh, urban sociologist uh, and mentor for us who asked the question in his book, City Life from Jakarta to Dakar, he says, don't ask any other question about the city. Don't start with politics, don't start with ideology, don't start with who's to blame for one anything. Just ask the question, what can urban residents do with each other at any given time? And that will lead you to both all of the obstacles and opportunities about forms of urban collectivity, commoning, and collaboration. And I want to mention that it's also from uh, Malik's work that we take the concept of the city yet to come. Uh, in fact, he wrote a very important uh, book speaking to uh, the history of African cities uh, called The City Yet to Come. And so in trying to take his approach to urbanism and appreciation of emergent forms of organization, of residential epistemologies, of ways of knowing that are specific to people who live in cities that people who don't live in cities cannot understand. Um, we asked the question, essentially, what would Malik Simone design as software? No? Um, and one of the things that, that Malik Simone would, of course, insist on is that you don't design software on your own and that you don't design it with no purpose. 
Um, and so a lot of our research involved what we call discovering the infrastructure point of view, which is traveling through the systems which we're trying to understand by boat or by other means, motorcycle or whatnot, to begin to uncover how they work. And this is um, uh, one expedition down the Chiliwong River, uh, about 25 kilometers, with, with the Chiliwong Institute, an, an urban activist organization in Indonesia. And what we're trying to figure out in this ex expedition, um, other than doing some brown water rafting, which is always fun, um, is, is that one of the main reasons that the government gives for the eviction and demolition of houses along the edge of the river is that poor people throw their trash in the river. Poor people throw their trash, and they're dirty, and their trash is in the river, and the river caught, and that causes floods, and therefore we need to essentially exterminate that form of life along the river's edge. Now, the funny thing about blaming all of the trash in a major city like Jakarta on the poor people is that if they're really urban poor, where do they get all of this stuff? Like, it seems like a very odd argument that people who live on less than a dollar a day are producing all of the garbage that's clogging up the system. And so working with the Urban Poor Consortium and the Chiliwong Institute, we decided to GPS some of this uh, trash along the river because, as you can see in this image, in the, in the bamboo fence at the top, you can't see this dump from the street. This dump is hidden from any street view but, you, but if you're traveling through the river, you begin to understand someone's running a pretty serious dump uh, here, but there is not detectable at the street level, similarly along, along in this area. And so as we GPS those locations, we begin to figure out, well, are the, are the urban poor running giant dumps where all of the city's trash is being dumped into the river? Uh, and, and the overlay uh, of those locations, I. I suspect will not surprise you in the least, were police stations and military bases. Um, and so what then we start to understand is that the police and the military are subsidizing their own incomes by offering uh, low-cost dumping areas within the city uh, for, for all of the trash removal, and thus the garbage never actually makes it out of the city. It's scooped out of the river, brought upstream, and dumped back inside while all the residents are displaced to shitty low-rise housing because allegedly they throw trash in the river. And so even though we can produce that evidence, bring it to the government, work in coalition forms to try to make some advocacy about slowing this process down and thinking through it, um, the, the concrete keeps getting pounded into the ground, it's, it's essentially becoming increasingly difficult to remove, and um, the violence of the banks of the river begins to become more prominent than the violence of, of the river itself and the flooding itself. And so one of the big questions then became for us, if this is what the city's gonna do to try to prevent flooding, what's gonna be the spin-off effect for all of the residents? So in a series of really late and long conversations in a number of communities, Essentially, what we discover is that all of the forms of collective care and response to natural disasters are interrupted by these stupid walls because they prevent ways of crossing through the flood, essentially don't prevent the flood, but interrupt all of the forms of solidarity that respond to it. The one that was most particularly um, alarming and disturbing for anyone who wants to make urbanism kind of make sense um, is that residents in a number of neighborhoods in anticipation of the monsoon with no support from the government whatsoever would design what we call anastrophic design and so which comes from the title of the lecture and so a catastrophe is the past coming apart being ripped apart an anastrophe, theatrically, is the future coming together. It's a process of convergence on a future horizon. And so what you're looking at is a, a street in Jakarta, flooded, up chest high, and this red rope running into the, into the foreground of the image 
is installed in advance of this flood. All throughout the neighborhood, carabiners are attached to the houses, and a rope line is run from the lowest point to the highest point, so that when a flood occurs, if it occurs at night, if it occurs unexpectedly, especially if it occurs at night, because the number one thing you need to do is turn off your electricity, well, evacuating into the dark and into water chest high is not a particularly good way to find your way out and avoid drowning. So, as this incredibly cheap, incredibly efficient way of ensuring everyone can find their way to a rescue point is a way of saying, it's not flooded now, but when it is, the street will be dark, the water will be chest high, we'll want to go from one place to another, and so let's design something that isn't going to cost very much, but that will be in the place where it needs to be when all of these factors converge. Great. So then, the government, being ready to come and rescue everyone in a heroic and thoughtful way, come up in their rescue boats. And then we find a second material conflict, which is that a boat running along the surface of this water is being propelled by an outboard motor which, as it runs over the rope, cuts it in half. And so we have urban residents self-organizing to produce anastrophic design as a preparedness measure for anticipating climate change contingencies, and the government doing their best to rescue them, and the, and the interference of those two realities negate the intentions of both. And people are literally pulling on a rope that's been cut by the people trying to rescue them. So that's bullshit. So that's like that's a that's a thing that when you are looking at this as a designer, you have to say, okay, well, it's intolerable that human beings can work that hard and have outcomes that stupid. Um, but fortunately, people in Jakarta, like people in Mexico City, are just like wild on Twitter. They can get really storming going going, and so. What, what you often see, and what I see and I, I, I adore, are people taking their first selfies with their kids in the flood. Because you want to remember that shit. And so, <laughs> like, and so in here, it's like, Dad, like, look at this, this is so awesome, and it's like, let's do the thing, and now I'm going to like send my message. What I love about this image is that you see Jalan Raya Jatinagara Baran on the top, and it's like, we took this photograph and we were looking at this photograph and I said, that information is connected to that tweet. That phone is connected to a geospatial network, to the GNSS network that uses GPS, but it's also connected to social media. So we know how high the water is ankle high and we know exactly where he's standing because his phone contains a GPS unit. So if we could just put those two things together, we would actually have a really great idea of what the flood, where the flood was happening and in what time. Similarly, if we went into the communities and started to map all of the evacuation lines in advance of flooding and mark them into those same maps, then we would have a sense of where we would need to actually be to coordinate uh, folks picking them up in a useful way. And if we could do something really simple, like hijack Mark Zuckerberg's piece of shit Facebook platform and turn it into something useful where people could get their data back and actually have some control of their own lives, that would be pretty helpful too. Um, and finally, if we could essentially remember the heights and be able to run those things analytically forward and backward, that then we could maybe have some longer term resource allocation that would be meaningful. And so we essentially um, wrote a series of bots that are illegal on Twitter. Um, and as we turned them on as a research project, uh, Twitter sent us a cease and desist order and threatened to sue us and take all of our money from everything that we ever had and never let us do social media again. <laughs> and we said, that's cool, but um, can we just have all of the flood data that's ever been reported in Indonesia because uh, that would be really helpful to design the software that would process that data. And so what you're looking at is every tweet that mentions the word flood uh, from 2013 uh, overlaid on the outline of the center 
of, of Jakarta uh, in the millions. And what you see are all of the roadways and a number of um, other, the, the urban environment starts to kind of uh, explain itself. But what you also see is a little white spot here. And I point that out because on the right of the image, this is a military base. Apparently, Twitter not as popular on the military base. But also, because of the heterogeneity of the demographics of Jakarta, there's a lot of social media coming from a lot of areas. And what, what, when we got this data and laid this out, it was like, OK, there's the river. This is, this is the river mediated through social media as every person standing in the river, which is no longer in its banks, but now filling the city everywhere, saying that the water has now become mediated as its own torrential form, a tweet storm. And if we could design a more effective software to deal with that, we would really be in an interesting place. And so um, that software stack is called Cognicity. I'm not going to speak too much about it, but I'll just give you a sense of the early form. Essentially, dudes talking about flooding. Uh, humanitarian chatbot goes, yo, dude, can you tell us about that flooding a little more specifically? He says, yo, flood is this high. Here's a photo. This is my neighborhood. This is where I'm at. Um, similarly, just calling this one out, I'm like, shit's pretty serious. Can you turn on the pumps, governor? You know, WTF. Um, and so that began to work really effectively, and we uh, sort of rebranded it as a project called Petapanchana, which means disaster map Indonesia, um, and, start, and started to scale to, and spread to various cities. And so essentially, um, what we try to do is parasite on every form of social media, instant messaging, and any individual application by a process that looked something like this, which I promise I won't try to explain. But essentially, how do we create an infrastructure as software that can ride on all of those other systems without being committed to them in any way. We call that medium agnostic design. We're not connected to Twitter, Facebook, or, or, or Instagram, but we can rely on those pieces of infrastructure as a parasite and extract the information that we share on it back to ourselves. And so um, essentially, that flood map looks something like this. Uh, in a, a little closer resolution. And what these poly, these yellow polygons are essentially districts that are being tagged as, as flood affected. You can see you know, serious coastal inundation there at the port. But I'll just give you the, the really straightforward summary. Uh, and this is the kind of embed that the first time you use this system, you, you would see this video. If there is. Is, could you guys turn this on? Yeah. Way up. is a free and open source Swiss map for Indonesia. This video will explain how you can share flood information by submitting a report using Twitter, Telegram, or this local applications. When you tweet hashtag banjir to at Petabenjana, we help you input flood information at photos, describe the situation, and confirm your location. Then we put your report on a map and send you a link to share with your followers. On Telegram, text slash banjir to at bencana board so we can help you make a report. Then we'll send you a link to the map so you can see and share your report. We also gather information from these local applications. If you share a flood report with your app, we'll add it to the map. However you report, Check Peta Bencana to see up-to-date flood information. Government agencies also add flood status updates to the map, so watch for this when you navigate. When we all share what we see, everyone can stay informed, avoid danger, and we just use together. Visit petabencana.id to get started. So you get the kind of tone of that, of trying to kind of keep it like not apocalyptic and, 
and in a, in a way a kind of kind of casual participation. Um, but I just want to make a few remarks. That project has now scaled and serves approximately 65 million people in Indonesia. Uh, it was copied and is now being developed in Burma, Thailand, and Vietnam. It ran this year in India, uh, Florida, and we're piloting in the state of New York. Um, and in each of those instances, there, there's a certain build out about the, the specific risk, the specific geography, etc. But what I really want to kind of push as the last five minutes here is a question about, about the politics of urban maintenance uh, in terms of the, the cities of the future that we're going to live in. And, and this, this concern with maintenance came to us not really as much from software as from a collaboration we were doing with the epidemiological researchers from the School of Public Health. Uh, and we were trying to understand um, dengue, uh, the dengue virus, which is uh, transmitted by humans and mosquitoes, or can be in our blood and transmitted to mosquitoes, and they can give it to us. Um, and it requires an incredibly intense maintenance regime that's changing under climate change, right? So. Um, tropical illnesses multiply faster, mosquitoes multiply faster, and in, in, in every way, climate change will have tremendous effects um, on, on epidemiology. Um, but as we started to look at the, the politics of maintenance and, and urban maintenance around uh, this fogging process, which is essentially spraying insecticide everywhere in the city trying to kill mosquitoes and everything else to prevent the spread of dengue, we had a visitor, and this is in our courtyard in Jakarta, in our office, and, and this woman is what is called, uh, colloquially, a larva lady. And larva ladies come around and check out your pots and, your, and stuff in your house, and then they kind of shame you if there are mosquito larvae in them. And they're like, don't you realize what you're kind of doing in your neighborhood? And in a way, it's, it's a sense of a very low budget program of local folks hanging out and talking to people in their neighborhood about how a behavioral change can have a radical effect on reducing forms of illness in the city. And when um, Larva Lady came to see us, she was like, yeah, the government is going to cut this program because it doesn't prove that it re reduces uh, dengue outbreaks. And so what we asked was, how do they prove when these dudes spray poison everywhere that this is an effective means of uh, mitigation, where the women promoting behavioral change in their own communities are treated as completely negligible? And the answer, unsurprisingly, is that BASF, formerly IG Farben Group in Germany, who produce these chemicals, have lab tests that say that if Indonesia doesn't spray these chemicals, many people could die. Um, and so we have, in essence, a very interesting neo-colonial relationship of supply, which allows European science and technology to say, if you don't continue this regime, spraying this into all of your markets and all of your, in every possible place, and creating an urban spectacle of, of maintenance, um, you, you're putting your own population at risk. And so we were asked by the larva ladies, could we start producing, um, in, in essence, a quantification or justification of their work? And I, I bring this up because I, we, we decided not to do that as an organization. And instead, we really started to publish a lot about the European chemical industry and the way in which it was manipulating um, the, the municipal government in Jakarta. Because ultimately, and this comes to the kind of final point about maintenance, is that what we're trying to do is produce a network of both the users of our software, which are predominantly in these places, but appearing more in other cities. Uh, and if you're interested in at all in that, um, this is all open source, uh, available through GitHub. But what we're really trying to focus on is creating communities of care and communities of maintenance that utilize technical systems as a way of helping each other pay attention to and understand situations more carefully 
without ceding that knowledge to other parties. And so working with the larva ladies, we said, yeah, there's a lot of research we can do together um, as, as we do with other organizations, but let's also kind of push back against the quantification question and say that forms of behavioral change, social care, and social engagement are actually meaningful on their own terms and need to be fought for um, regardless of any comparison to a European uh, chemical lab. And I, I wanted to end on this project about humanitarian infrastructures, but I, I just want to say, we're, following that research, we began to work very closely with Medicine Sans Frontieres in understanding how they can be reading urban epidemiological information at a global scale and feeding back and forth between the urban stacks of, of the software for the city yet to come, and at the same time pulling that into a new relationship between humanitarian organizations, urban organizations, and a model of decentralized, coordinated information sharing that allows residents to do things with each other, whether or not governments are taking the steps to respond to climate change uh, as we need them to be. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Hola, pues muy buenas tardes a todos. Yo soy Gabriela Gómez Norta, directora del Laboratorio para la Ciudad. Eh, para tener una conversación fluida, si no les importa, voy a hablar en, en inglés. Eh, tenemos, como saben, traducción. Um, so thank you so much for that. I'm actually going to speak in, in English to make it a little bit easier. And when we get to questions and answers from the audience, we can switch to Spanish to make it a little bit easier on us. Um, so thanks, first of all, for your second visit as well as for the presentation. One of the things that um, your presentation was provoking was some memories of the time that you were here last, which was several weeks after we had a terrible, terrible crisis here after the, the earthquake that, as you know, we have our anniversary tomorrow. So in, in a, many ways, I think our experience here in Mexico City, experiences from other people that were also here with you, uh, as well as some people that came before, such as you, Shahidi crowd, are teaching us that this whole conversation around governance and how do we actually think about much more horizontal structures becomes every time more urgent, and especially during a crisis, and that there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from these spaces where the price is incredibly high, but possibly so are the lessons. Um, as you know, but for the people in the audience, we visited quite a few people that were fundamental in, in organizing efforts from civil society. And we saw that there was a very painful relationship with the government because basically we were traveling in two very different spheres at the time. So tell us a little bit, like, what are your thoughts post Mexico City a year after? I know you also had a couple of conversations today uh, with Karma visiting some people. How do we think about governance in this day and age? How, during catastrophe, do we think about that anastrophic uh, potential that we have as a society that possibly? What we need to mend there is what is most broken, which is many times the, the, this link between the institutions and the and citizens. And, and we truly, in terms of megacity especially, we have to go back possibly to thinking about the cities as systems of systems, and that resources are dynamic and need to, we need to find out where and how they are allocated at all times, and that that forcefully is going to necessitate a much better, well, basically other points of contact and other ways of, of coordinating. So, Tell us, I mean, we're very bluntly, um, the lab is known for being slightly blunt even being government. So what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on what that uh, anastrophic future could look like regarding? So um, I, I was really quite um, amazed, I would even say impressed, uh, where uh, normal folks like yourselves um, talking about the government following uh, September 19th, um, make a lot of the like super hardcore anarchist people I know seem very tame. <laughs> like Mexican people that I spoke with really don't like the government, like in serious, deep, <laughs> deep ways that um, I found um, uh, 
familiar, and um, but also surprising and, and challenging because, um, as as you may know, in, in Indonesia, uh, you know the government is not particularly beloved, not for um, the murder of three million communists, not for the dictatorship that ended only in the end of the eighties, um, and not for a lot of the neoliberal neoliberalization that followed from that. Um, but uh, they don't get 80% crank calls in their 911 thing per day, right? Like people seem to really like to fuck with the government here. And so um, one of the things that came out about this was, and you know, in a similar in, in, in many other cities where we've worked, not to the same degree, but it's a, the question is, no one, no, there's no government, not, not in Florida, not in New York State, not the U.S. Army, not, no one can respond to the scale of disasters that we now experience as a result of climate change. And so if we take that as a fact, that there will have to be some relationship between what people here call civil society, what I call folks who live in the place, whatever we want to say, and the people who govern them, um, I think for my question in terms of designing the future of the city we live in is how do we allow for forms of cooperation that don't require us to like each other? Um, I don't want to like hang out with those with all those people. I don't even want to know some of them, right? But if they know a street that I shouldn't drive down, and I know a street that they shouldn't drive down, um, that's, that's maybe information worth sharing. And, and some of you will be familiar with this. You know how, uh, now we've, we've bisected so much of nature, we have to put in these so-called nature bridges, like under highways or whatever, and, and like that allow for animal crossings in the natural world, yeah? You guys know what I'm talking about? So, of course, because we're complete uh, perps and put cameras and everything, right? And so, uh, so there's so all of them with cameras. But then what it turns out is that when animals that are typically predators and prey cross through a human, like nature bridge, they exhibit no signs of predator prey relationship and no animosity. Like, they'll walk through together and be like, fucking humans, you know, like, fuck them. And then, and then it's like, okay, I'll give you 10 meters, then I'm going to eat you. And, and so, that's real. That's like, now we have cameras and all of this, so we can voyeuristically enjoy non-human, multi-species forms of solidarity. And that reminds us that in certain moments of particularly intense challenges, like dealing with the humans, or dealing with the earthquake, or dealing with the flood, that there are forms of affinity that we don't need to all fight all the time. If, if a fox and a rabbit can walk through this tunnel just because they don't like humans and they don't like crossing the highway, we can share some information automatically between residents and government officials without getting our ideological concerns too much in a bunch, right? That. <laughs> Let's try. Let's try. <laughs> and and switching switching a little bit more towards uh, urban futures and the mega cities and I, I find very provocative this thing that you mentioned for designing for that convergence and for that city yet to come. Um, one of the things that we we did once upon a time at the lab was survey thirty one thousand people trying to figure out what their their vision of the future was for Mexico City, amongst many other things. It was more of, of trying to figure out what the subjective city that lives in people's head is like, vis-a-vis -vis the data that we have, you know, block by block of how many children and indexes of segregation and marginalization. It's how, how do you actually relate to the city? You know? And one of the things that we were curious about is when we prompted for, even though we were prompting rather for positive futures, we mostly got back Mad Max crazy scenarios for the future of Mexico City. So you know, I, I have a feeling that the mega cities, there's, there's a big uh, irony to deal with, but on one hand, yes, there's these tiny interventions, such as a red rope running across the streets that are in a weird way quite hopeful. 
And at the same time, it's exactly these spaces that are not necessarily prompting any type of other vision for the future. So how necessary is that really? Like, do we lead by the day to day? Do we, in terms of especially anastrophic design, so I'd actually love to hear a little bit more um, from your philosophical self uh, if you could tease out what you know your ideas and what you've been thinking about uh, beyond the platform itself in catastrophic, anastrophic, mega cities and tiny hopeful futures. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so, if we valorize the urban poor, the 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 um, the World Bank will uh, will fetishize them. And if, and that's that's a kind of condition that we're in, right? But I think regardless of how, I mean, I don't show that rope story because I don't think those people should have more resources allocated to their day-to-day -day situation. I show it because it does what the government can't think of doing with 10,000 times the amount of money that they have. Um, and so, when we have these conversations, often people say, yeah, but you're just doing the job of the government. We talked about this today in, in some of the interviews we're doing. And it's like, look, we need to talk about how urban resources are allocated to urban residents and the way that traditionally we allocate those resources is we elect representatives to go and deliberate over how those resources should be designated um, and that's worked for a few hundred years, more or less, sometimes better than others. Um, and I just don't know that those forms of representative deliberation are really going to do the, do the thing for the types of futures that, we're, that are converging. Um, and so I think that how we begin to design ways that residential epistemologies, ways that people know the problem because they live around and with the problem, direct investment, capital, resources towards the things that they would like to see fixed about it, um, is not a revolutionary position. Um, that people who understand how a problem functions in a particular area of the city would have insights into what would be the way to deal with it. Um, but this just requires a different conception of, of how governance is responding to residential knowledge, rather than trying to dictate how the city should function, and then assuming that any number of surveillance cameras, police officers, and other forms of securitization will be able to deliver that vision. Um, and that means giving up a lot of control, but they're going to have to give it up one way or another. So, you know. And I guess it also points towards um, experimental practices because it's these, I think, lessons, I mean, I think our, our inheritance from modernist days where we thought that cities were the things to be molded, not only rivers, but everything else within it, including society, were supposed to be uh, molded by this big, unwieldy hand from above. Um, so I have a feeling that we, we have to go into new spaces and also be ready to, to, to try other things. And I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions regarding, um, but it reminds me of um, another exercise that we did when we were mapping the informal bus system of Mexico City. So we, you know, since it's a gargantuan task, and there's like 30,000 microbuses across the city, 1,400 routes, um, we gamified the whole thing. Oh, sorry? There weren't maps. There were no maps. Right, but no they maps. worked. Uh, sorry? But they worked. They work, and so this is actually what I'm, I'm getting to, which is still an open-ended question because we still haven't figured it out. But so basically, the, the weird thing is that Mexico City grew 35 times in size since the 60s to now. So the bus system grew along right with it, and as a government, we have no idea what's happening on the ground. And I'm sure there are thousands of, of inefficiencies to be had, including like mortal inefficiencies where you suddenly have like the microbuseros speeding down avenues, sometimes in, in, in contrary direction to catch the passage before his, their, their competitor does, because here you can own a bus, even if you're a person, like the laws just change, but you know, as a person you could say, okay, I want a bus, and so you get your own bus, uh, unlike other places in the city. 
But funnily enough, um, when we were doing a couple of exercises with waves, it turns out that many of these routes are actually as efficient as waves because of course, like they're optimizing for other things. Like they're optimizing for uh, passage and the density of people in the quickest route, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have other places across Mexico City, such as um, Lawak, who, who has this fabulous thing where they've taken golf carts, electric golf carts that are super cheap, and that's what they use as informal taxi cabs. So they're super cheap, they're super, efficient energetically. And then you have in Tlaloc up the mountains, you've got like this battered cars that are giving a taxi service because no other normal car will go up there. So you have a city inventing its own solutions to a mobility problem that is huge. Like we have the most painful commute here. And it's been very interesting, not necessarily successful yet, <laughs> but you know, trying to sit with the people um, that do mobility and say, instead of prohibiting it, because that's actually what we're going towards, is how do we actually use that as part of the system? Like how do you, figure out where the inefficiencies are of an emerging system, and then comes in the top down. Then you go, okay, like, you know, maybe we should do this, and maybe here we should not have like 20 microbuses or whatever. Um, so I'd be curious to know, do you have any other examples that you're hopeful about of experimental practices, you know, and on any scale, like uh, on a larger, uh, smaller scale, knowing that you traverse not only tons of disciplines, but also tons of cities in your life? Um, so, just because we give the traffic example, um, so in Washington D.C., um, they they put in a toll highway coming into to the like downtown to like the core of, of Washington, and um, you know people don't want to pay tolls, so everyone would leave the highway, go into like essentially suburban neighborhood, drive the length of the high and come back on, right? To avoid this, this toll route. <laughs> Which then meant like there's tons of, of what is highway traffic running through these neighborhoods and everyone's kind of like, what, what the fuck? And complaining, you know, why we gotta do something about this. And then of course someone's like, watch this, and takes out their ways and just reports an accident on the road. And then none of the cars will go there because Waze is like, there's an accident, so they stay on the highway. So that essentially the, the whole community just realized, well, just when whoever's like up first, just like put an accident and like keep all the cars out of our neighborhood. And I think that, that those are like useful things that explain system, like it's a super simple thing to put a, an accident on Waze. But it explains a whole series of other urban processes and also just gets rid of the problem. Like, we don't need to go to our congressmen and get them to pass a bill. It's just like, no, don't bring your car here. Like, we, and in that kind of software arms race, sometimes just like the easiest hack gets rid of the problem. I mean, we can talk at huge scales as well, but. Um, I do think that, like, that's residential epistemology. That's someone saying, I don't want my kids walking down the street to school with everyone running the red because they're trying to, like, drive on a residential street as if it's a highway, and they don't care about this neighborhood because they don't live here. And, like, so how do we get them to stop? And it's like, well, we know the thing that they're all using. Let's fuck that up and get our neighborhood back. Like, those, that's residential epistemology for me. And so, the question is, how does that aggregate build itself up, find ways of, of um, creating momentum that distributes resources at the next scale? Last but not least, before passing the questions to the audience, um, I know that there is a few people interested in design in, in the audience. And um, looking towards the future into these things that you're imagining. What is the role of the philosopher designer? Like I know that you you open up the Strelka, um, the Strelka, I don't know what you call it, is, a, is, a, is it a, a course, seminar. a seminar? Like you open up the seminar and your place is actually to mess with a new generation of designers' brains and get them thinking in much more provocative ways and uh, not necessarily the little boxes that we put design into. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And, and we, we have, uh, we've been thinking about uh, at the lab 
and then I think as if things are growing into thematic within from designers, and like what is a new role for us in, in, in these types of societies and these types of futures? So I'd love to hear a little bit more, and then we'll pass over the microphone to the audience. Well, humanities folks out there will, will be familiar with the fact that philosophy has been obsessed with the city since both of those things kind of came into being together, at least in the fantasy Western imaginary of some like oily Greek bathhouse. Um, and because, you know, I mean, I, I lived in Jakarta for five years and, and now I'm based in Berlin and arriving in Mexico was just like, oh, yeah, Mexico, home. Um, and because there is so much to, to think about and any, any urban artifacts can lead you into a kind of infinity possible ways of reading the city. The politics, the ethics, the, the love stories, the, the, the conflicts. Um, and, and, and like the city is just an infinity artifact um, that, that allows for all these ways of reading. But in terms of like changing the scale, the blowing up the scales, one of the things that I want to put a huge shout out to Nashim Matani, who runs the office in Jakarta right now, one of the things we really started paying attention to was like all of the ways that we're trying to hack all of these platforms, like we want to, to get into those platforms, so we need to understand how they work. But what they're really tracking is all of the neuroscience and neuroplasticity studies about how to get your attention. And so we're like in the world of like humanitarian attention, is what we like to say. Mm -hmm. It's like how do we intervene in the intention ecology of social media and instant messaging to like redirect that attention toward like caring about each other or helping each other out? And one of the big things about that is, is related to privacy and encryption, security and anonymity. Um, and so we want governments to be transparent, but we also want people to be able to be anonymous when they when they criticize the government in the same way that we want to know what the budget of the government is, but we don't want the government to know who we voted for, because then there could be retribution around it. And so I think how this relates to attention is that we need to create systems that allow for people to trust them in such a way that they feel like they're useful, that it's worth participating in, but without pretending that everyone wants to be like a kind of hero on Instagram or whatever. And so what we're really trying to work between is, is a kind of the minimum viable sociality, the minimum viable municipal sociality. I don't want to like you. I don't even like you. I don't even like what the, the way you decorate your front yard, but I don't want your kids to die in a flood. I don't like the way that I'm governed. I don't like this particular government, but they should tell me where these where these particular uh, you know uh, refuge points are if I'm pushed out of my house. And so I think if we can move away from a kind of get along gang fantasy politics where the city is like everyone like happily being like in this kind of Lego world or whatever, where which is which is kind of disturbing. But I, I mean, cities are great because you can also ignore like ninety five percent of everything that's going on. It's like you know when I was walking over here, it's like I don't know why that guy is doing that thing in the park. I don't know if it's legal or not, but I don't have to go like address it. Someone like we can all there's an anonymity and a presence thing that I think is important. And so in terms of design thinking, I think the politics of care isn't necessarily a giant form of obligation. Like we can care about each other and help each other out and have new forms of solidarity that don't mean we fucking pledge allegiance to some society or like join some get along gang group or whatever, but that we like can work together around issues as individuals who don't have to all want to like each other all the time. And, and because that's what a city is. And, and like, I know it maybe sounds a bit um, 
pessimistic, but I actually find that like the government in in many cities in Indonesia, also in, in Ho Chi Minh City, they have such a disdain for the way that people send in information. But over the course of the process, they start to understand, like, right, that's why they hate when we do that. And residents start to understand, right, I know this is totally stupid, but they're doing this for a reason. And there's a tremendous amount of friction, we we're, were saying this this morning, there's a tremendous amount of friction between a formal and informal system. And if, and if design can turn that friction into traction where things can get done, instead of turbulence where everyone just yells at each other and, and whatnot, then that's like a useful place for designing at the interface of formal and informal systems to capture some of their energy and some of their you know, some of the energy of the informal and some of the structure of the formal without just having them collide and cancel each other out, like a boat driving over a rope in the water. Well, we, we thought that that's probably the future, especially in society, that is you know, being able to figure out that interface. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta para Etienne? Wow, awesome. Yeah. Hola, buenas noches a todas y a todos. Y muchas gracias por esta plática, Gabriela y a ti. Esta pregunta sería un poco para ambos. ¿Ustedes considerarían que las nuevas formas de participación a nivel local y comunitario en las grandes ciudades son parte de este futuro anastrófico en vez de esas formas tradicionales de planeación gubernamental con vistas más generales, casi nacionales, pero que con el tiempo se han visto cada vez como más, más rebasadas? ¿Qué, ¿Qué comentario te dirían al respecto? Take a few, or do we want to just yeah. one by one? It's easier okay, for you. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of static in this, but that's a great question. I would just say that yes, if the participation is meaningful. I I mean, we we use the term architecture washing, where they bring in architects to like work with the community and get them to vision what they want and like all of this as a way of distracting them while bulldozers are approaching, you know? And, and architects are super good at architecture washing and making like really amazing, fanciful, utopian plans for the urban poor as a way of helping them be distracted to not fight for the land that they're about to have stolen. And so, and that's, at least for me in Southeast Asia, that's the norm, that's what architects do in, in the context of urban poverty. And so, I think that the, the question of what is the threshold of meaningful participation? It means that when residents make decisions, they're respected. When residents say, we don't want this here, it's not put there. And that, and that level of, of respectful engagement of participation, I think would go a long way in remedying the hatred of government, because if it's all just we'd like your opinion so that we can waste some time and do whatever we were going to do anyway. This is the reason why so many people here, but elsewhere, are like, why would we wait for the government to do anything? They make a lot of promises, put up some nice posters, bring us to an event, tell us that we're going to have this, and while we're there, they build us our house. Me, me parece una gran pregunta y siento que justamente eh, lo que dice Tien es importante de cómo no se vuelve simulacro. Inclusive más bien revirtiendo los papeles, ahorita estamos trabajando con el antropólogo Pablo Landa, que está haciendo estudios de distintos sistemas de gobernanza que existen en diferentes comunidades de la Ciudad de México. Y hay un repertorio inmenso de posibilidades que justo lo platicaba con alguien que es experto en movimientos sociales en, en la Ciudad de México, 
También hay un, un tema a decidir, porque por una parte que no sean visibles han permitido en muchas ocasiones que eh, se den estas nuevas formas de gobernanza que, digamos, podríamos irnos hacia las heterotopías en vez de las utopías, ¿no? Hay muchas alternativas sucediendo simultáneamente en, en vez de esta gran idea de futuro. Pero al mismo tiempo, cuando no se visibilizan, creo que parte de lo que han estado tratando muchos de los eh, politólogos y demás es que ahorita parecería ser que no hay afuera a nuestras, a, a nuestras alternativas, por ejemplo, capitalistas. Entonces, en el momento que no visibilizamos estas otras formas de generar comunidad, de organizarse, como podría ser el colectivo de Palo Alto, como podría ser inclusive darles un clavado al pasado y ver qué ha pasado con los ejidos, con las cooperativas, con las economías sociales, que México tiene una historia inmensa de haberse generado desde ahí, entonces siento que eso podría ser una, una gran discusión, especialmente para ciudadanos como la nuestra, porque suceden simultáneamente que sucede todo el resto. Lo único que creo que es delicado y que hay que ir pian pianito es justamente qué rol tiene el gobierno en esto para no cooptar esos sistemas sociales que están sucediendo bien sin la intervención del Estado o del gobierno. Y básicamente entender más bien cómo lo, lo potencializa. O sea, hablando, o sea, con el ejemplo de Tienda de Yakarta también me vino a la mente eh, Xochimilco, con más bien el, el, pues sí, de, de las señoras y las barbas y demás, en donde pues justamente las grandes corporaciones convencieron a los chinamperos que tenían que utilizar fertilizantes porque por eso no les estaban rindiendo las chinampas. Hoy en día la acroponia, que es uno de los sistemas más avanzados que hay, de súper productivos por metro cuadrado, está basado en las chinampas. Había una sabiduría hace 600 años que perdimos y que justamente espero que se recupere y que entonces en el momento que no tomamos en cuenta eso, visibilizamos ese saber que ya existe en nuestras sociedades, sí siento que de pronto se vuelve muy vulnerable a estas grandes eh, y, y muchas veces monolíticas ideas de lo que deberían de ser nuestras sociedades, nuestra política, nuestras formas organizacionales y demás. Entonces, con la cautela de vida, creo que efectivamente ese es el futuro que debemos investigar para sociedades como las nuestras. Hello, uh, my name is Omar. Uh, thanks very much for the talk, that's very interesting. Um, first of all, I must say that I'm very supportive of the adoption of information and communication technologies to improve policy making in general. But having some experience myself, although in a different field, mostly related to crime and conflict prediction, I have some concerns as we push forward uh, this, this agenda. And I'm just going to talk about three examples related actually to, to the flooding example that uh, you mentioned in the talk. Uh, because, for example, you're mentioning that we can use, for, for example, social media or Twitter data to try to understand the dynamics or, the, or to better predict the reporting of flooding. Uh, I try to do similar things uh, for Mexico using Twitter data, and I've encountered three big problems. One of them is coverage. We all know that, for example, universe of Twitter is very, a very small subset of, for example, of the population of the country with very specific sociodemographic characteristics. And of course, we will be capturing a biased uh, subset of, of, of the population that we are interested in. The other issue is uh, misreporting in the sense that I might talk about flooding, although I'm in an area or a region of the country where there is no actual flooding. But I'm just talking about this because it's in the news and it's a trending topic. Uh, There are also problems uh, of coverage in the sense that many people don't record their GPS coordinates or not even their location or their city. And I know that there are ways of trying to correct for these different sources of biases and to validate this information. But at the end of the day, I think this raises a very important ethical question for both policymakers and researchers. Because we have to decide on how to allocate resources for, in this case, for natural disasters, but also for tackling uh, poverty or crime. And there are a lot of resources that are invested. And if we don't have a reliable measure of uh, the phenomenon that we are trying to, uh, to tackle, then we will be in a situation that could be extremely dangerous because we are not measuring uh, what we want to measure in a reliable way. So I just want to note, uh, I'd like to refer your thoughts about both the implementation and the ethical issues that we face as we push forward this agenda. Thank you, uh, it's a really important question and I appreciate you bringing 
uh, both your experience and, and, the, and the broader ethical implication. Um, so two important things that you guys got to know. Uh, we started this work in Southeast Asia very specifically because of the proliferation of mobile technology and smartphones. Jakarta has one of the highest rates of adoption of smartphones. It's over 150%, which means every other person has two phones that they're using simultaneously. So the laboratory, in that sense, was selected very deliberately. It also has one of the highest social media concentrations in the world and has held the number one spot multiple times. In Southeast Asia, of those 10 countries, there are 650 million residents and 750 million smartphones. So it's for this kind of stuff, it's a particularly useful place to be working. Um, now, with the Medicine Sans Frontieres project, working in Dakar, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, Lebanon, we're, we're confronted with these issues of access and representation in a much more direct way than in Southeast Asia. And a lot of that is now pushing us to develop different online tools, ways that people can be using um, uh, SMS. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, I, I don't mean in any way to suggest that this solution or th these sets of ideas are transferable one to one, um, but I, I do think we're going to move to a place where a smartphone is, is essentially a human right. It's like you, you can't you, you can't survive without some way of being connected to that system. Um, with respect to the specific questions about Twitter. You should uh, have a mezcal after, and, and I can tell you how to beat the few of those problems because I, I cannot tell you the number of times people have shown me maps of things and said, lots of people care about this right here, and I've said, no, lots of people live right there. And, and so the density of people reporting something and the density of people caring about something have no correlation, and we've worked on a number of papers to try to dissuade our colleagues from imagining that Twitter data gives clear images of a lot of these things. And maybe it wasn't clear, and I'll just take one second to explain this, because it's probably useful. We, we don't, or we no longer, extract information directly. What we do is use every other infrastructure as a payload delivery system. So I hear you talking about flooding, and I send you a link and say, at Homer, flooding, click this link. And when you click that, you're brought out of your platform back into the free and open internet, as is, um, and you fill in your survey, micro survey, simple GUI, and that gets sent back to us. We can then thank you back through that platform, but we've essentially delinked the information gathering from the solicitation. So the GPS and everything else that Twitter and Facebook can block, we can get through another mechanism. The brutality of these lessons and the hours and nights and months and, and, and years of trying to find a way to extract from those platforms without being tied to them is why I would encourage any of you who want to do anything like this to just freely take anything out of our open source stack because it's now you know a multi-million dollar piece of free software that can resolve a lot of those problems um, that you should you know that are that are pretty smart ways of dealing with those those specific issues. But we can I'm happy to talk about them really in detail. Gracias. Eh, soy Graciela Ramírez Mecina de Tacubaya. Eh, eh, quisiera compartir, bueno, ahorita para nuestro ponente, el asunto de que a dos estaciones de aquí, eh, los tacubayenses vivimos, así como estamos viendo ese río o un asunto de algo que no es eh, normal, natural, cada día el paso de un afluente de 200.000 personas 
que nadie nos pidió permiso para que pasaran por nuestras calles, en 150 hectáreas. Eh, pasan por arriba, por más arriba, doble piso periférico, salen del metro y nos, se abalanzan sobre los que ahí vivimos. Yo quisiera plantear ahorita el asunto de esta cuestión de la epistemología residencial, en donde nosotros hemos aprendido a empoderarnos a partir de ser, por ejemplo, peatones irregulares. No usamos nuestras banquetas, usamos eh, la fluente de los carros donde van con el tráfico cargado. Y nosotros hace poco hemos empezado a reflexionar que eso nos empoderó. O sea, sí están los comerciantes, 2.000 puestos de comercio público e informal, sí están 15 líneas de camiones a ras, pero nosotros somos y hemos adquirido capacidades y habilidades para transitar. Yo hace ratito pensaba y decía, podemos ir caminando ahí, es una zona de riesgo, pero podemos ir platicando, cantando, pensando, haciendo cuentas, es decir, haciendo toda una circunstancia, solos o acompañados. Y en este solos acompañados nosotros nos hemos ido, a pesar de todo este caos, apropiando. Aquí es donde la circunstancia filosófica nos gustaría escuchar a nuestros ponentes, porque lo sufrimos, nos enojamos, pero al mismo tiempo nosotros amamos nuestro barrio y como tenemos la habilidad, no nos importa que aún no haya llegado la regeneración urbana por lo que hemos trabajado. Y también en este sentido, la manera en que hemos dialogado los sectores que estamos impulsando la regeneración urbana, ustedes van a oír sistemas de actuación por cooperación, a diferencia de otros lugares en la ciudad, lo pedimos los vecinos, porque en este quiebre de gobernanza en los últimos ocho años, pues nos robó el dinero el gobierno, el diputado, el delegado, el, el no apareció después de salir en Gaceta, y nuestra mejor opción, este, alejándonos también del poderío del narco menudeo, que es un fuerte motor económico en nuestro barrio, pues nos acercamos a la iniciativa privada. Entonces el diálogo de gobernanza no tiene que ver solamente con el gobierno o la autoridad formal, la que va saliendo, la que va entrando. Tiene que ver con quien va a poner el dinero para nuestra mejora, que va a ser la iniciativa privada. En este sentido, para nosotros la epistemología residencial, si lo entiendo bien, Edgar, tiene que ver también con la utopía. A pesar de circunstancias adversas, violentas, de estigmatizaciones, los tacubayenses seguimos soñando en una tacubaya bella, estoy hablando en este sentido de la estética. Y hay una circunstancia fuerte de emoción, pero también de temor de no hundirnos más. Y entonces nuestro proceso dice, ustedes no han avanzado en tantos años. Y lo que nosotros solemos decir es, no nos hemos terminado de hundir, y ese es un gran trabajo. Eh, lo ético está puesto sobre la mesa, porque nosotros sabemos que los puestecitos venden droga, sabemos que nuestros vecinos son los que toman la pistola y asaltan, pero hay códigos, hay como lealtades básicas para sobrevivir como grupo. Y lo que quiero poner en la mesa, porque finalmente aquí tendremos que ser los buenos buenos, parece que no hay oportunidad. Y en esta cuestión filosófica sí nos causa conflicto, porque exigimos transparencia, lealtades y bondades. Cuando se habla de que Tacubaya no sea este, esta cuestión de expulsar poblaciones, nosotros les decimos a los vecinos, recuerden que si se quedan los cobayenses, se quedan todos los que estamos aquí. Hasta una población en un 50% de delincuencial, es decir, población de reclusorios y de tutelares. I don't know where, where they are, but they, but to just say uh, thank you uh, to the translators for uh, making a lot of this conversation possible and acknowledge that labor. Um, but no, thank you for the comments. Um, look, I, as with any forms of solidarity work that we do, um, we take our directive from the people who we're working with, um, and so. Uh, this is very slow software, this is slow science, uh, if we want to call it that. We, you know, the platform that I described to you took 
years and years to build. Um, thousands of hours of, of meetings with, with residents who were affected uh, and with government officials. And I think that that's something that um, is really underappreciated in the world of academia and in the world of, of, of governance, which is that building the relationships that are necessary for people to transform a space in a positive way, uh, whether there's technology involved or not, um, it's not done as a semester studio, it's not like a, a visit, it's not a tourism project. Um, and I think that one of the really challenging, or one of the things the concept of residential epistemology tries to challenge is that the, the sort of North American, uh, especially in America, U US, uh, United States schools, Canadian schools as well, European schools, they want to come to Mexico or Jakarta or uh, Manila or whatever so that they can bring some solution from their, from their academia. And they come for a week and talk to a person in the Kampong or a person in the favela and then they come with the solution. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, the texture of cityness, the, the intricacy and complexity of love and fear and cruelty and concern and care and the depth of neighborhoods um, and how they might start to leverage some of their own histories and some of their own momentum into certain directions, technically, infrastructurally, architecturally, um, can only be effectively and meaningfully led by those residents, whether through co-research or whatnot. But I think what it really strikes, uh, strikes me is, is when you describe the situation, um, that any designer who would call themselves a designer, who would have the audacity to propose something in this context, um, I would hope is, is willing to spend the time to really be there and, and, and absorb that residential epistemology. And that would be entirely at odds with the design disciplines as we now understand them. And so I think in our repeated commitment to this question of residential epistemology is also a refusal to this kind of startup culture of like, I'm going to make a solution and spin it out in all these places. Um, and one of the reasons why, despite in tremendous pressure to turn this stack into a startup thing that we can sell to all of these cities, um, was, well, pe we want people to work. We want, we're going to give this thing over, and then people will make what they need to make with it. And maybe they're going to deal with crime. Maybe they'll deal with an earthquake. Maybe they won't use any of it because it's completely useless for their problem. But um, I think getting away from urban design as a product um, that is a thing that you either sell or deliver, and thinking of design as a way of cultivating, strengthening, and diversifying relationships. Um, and, and, and understanding that not all of those relationships are good. Some of them are, are very difficult. But, but um, design is a process of creating momentum and, and, and strengthening and diversifying relationships. And I think that would really change the approach when people want to be working with a community like yours. They need to take a really different uh, ethical approach to that. Mine is short, so uh, what's the difference between anastrophic and resilient? Uh, um, do you, wait, 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 do you have a suggestion? Or, or are you, or give me a clue, are you a, do you, are you a resilient person? <laughs> How should I answer? Are you looking for pro or con resilience? No hands. No hands. Um, I would probably be to 
so <laughs> I, I was thinking about tomorrow. You know, I'm uh, a bit anxious about tomorrow. I'm going to sleep on my dreams. And um, I was thinking what happens if, if uh, our manners to go through what happened a year ago was anastrophic or resilient. Mm -hmm. I was so um, sure it was resilient. Now I'm thinking that all these change um, the way we use our uh, technology and the way we feel prepared for mm -hmm. anything that happens to us. So, I think um, sleeping uh, in your jeans is totally anastrophic design. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, never, I'm never going to be on my underwear in the street again. Yes. <laughs> and you know, I actually do that as one of the most from people that we have done ethnographic interviews with about earthquakes. Underwear is the number one theme <laughs> of like, not a chance of being in my underwear <laughs> when that happens again. So you have like, a global community of anastrophic jean-wearing sleepers who have got your back tonight. I, I'm pretty average. You know, okay. my, my password was the same that Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, so, I think that uh, there's a lot uh, to learn from the, the discourse around resilience. Um, we have, you know, been engaged with a number of, of people who are maybe like, the people who really kind of push that along. Um, I've always been kind of taken back by this um, this poster that, that people put up after Sandy in a number of um, racialized, predominantly black and Puerto Rican neighborhoods that was like, don't call us resilient. That were like posted um, as a like, that's not helping, yeah? And I think that that comes back to some of your comments, but also what I was trying to say earlier, I want to valorize the people who come up with this rope line system and say that like that's a better design than any of my design students have come up with in however many years of teaching around humanitarian infrastructure. But it doesn't mean that they don't need other resources and forms of social care, including ones that come from government. They also need other residents of the city to understand that people are not poor because they're fucking dumb or because they're lazy. They're poor because the system puts them there that way. And so I think for me, um, yeah, I, I, I guess my, my commitment to this term um, and this is coming from a book that I'm writing with my colleague Tom Holderness, um, is essentially that these are theatrical um, uh, indicators. Um, they, they refer to a movement on a stage. Yeah. And so the, the anastrophe, the future coming together in a kind of think in a kind of theatrical sense where you can see in the wings that all of a sudden this moment is going to arrive, yeah? that we're no longer the audience of that moment. We're all in the theater. You know? And so I think for, for me, the question is, how do we start to understand that as this convergence is happening, we're not passively watching that, but, but we're part of the design of what's going to arrive on the stage because we're on the stage. And so, um, but also, the software is not unlike a, um, is not unlike a kind of script. It's a it's a way of scripting a certain outcome. And so, how do we provoke certain conversations among the chorus? How do we how do we kind of script a certain scenario? We we're talking about this when when we were here last year. Um, it's my understanding that tomorrow there as part of a remembrance, but also a preparedness, people will evacuate. Like, we'll go out of the building and perform this thing, right? How would we turn that into a much broader form of theatricality? Everyone knows how to get in and out of the building. What do we do after that? How do we, how do we create forms of urban theater that allow us to like discover new ways of talking to each other? And in that way, I think resilience it's an important concept, but what I'm looking for is something much more um, 
something much more joyful, something much more um, active, and, and in a way, um, the, the, the levels of future that I'm talking about are both tomorrow and next September 19th, and the one in 10 years from now, and the one in 50 years from now, and how are those various ways of thinking those futures interacting with each other in our decisions and our allocation of resources? What would it mean to be in a place where in 10 years from now, that event would actually have very little consequence? Yeah? Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I am researching a lot of food systems. And uh, my question is about where the kind of CDs are urban spaces. But I have a little doubt this question about this really do you see it exist without the countryside? I mean with with food um, for instance twenty five years ago Mexico signed in NAFTA. And because of NAFTA a lot of cheap corn is coming to Mexico. And our national Corn producers are getting poorer and poorer each, each year. Mm -hmm. This is provoking in 20 years that they are left in corn and they are now cultivating cannabis and amapola. Some mistakes. And this is provoking a crisis now to the cities. Mm -hmm. Because now, this is the first time in your history that Mexico City accepts the government. We have a drug crisis crime drug crisis in Mexico City for the first time in history. You know, and that's because we have left the corn producers die. We have a national crisis in the countryside. So my question is, the city is getting so arrogant because we are letting the peasants die, the, the, the countryside is die, and we are blind to see to that. What is a system? Um, another example is we have a lot of women, young women, working in houses in the big city, sirvientas, or muchachas. They are indigenous people. Uh, when I took a bus, I listened to them talking in, in Otomi, an indigenous language. Uh, their, their dream is to get some money to someday, someday return to, to the city, to the, to the countryside. Mm -hmm. So can we, can we think the city has been isolated, has felt right, has this idyllic utopia? I have my doubt because without countryside, we don't can have cities. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question um, that is something that we've been looking at um, as well under the, under the title of uh, capitalization, where there are at least 60 countries global, uh, worldwide who have a single city that is growing, the capital. One city. In a time of climate change, and you talk about resilience, the idea to put just one single area of growth to let everything else stagnate and you receive no resource, it could not be a worse design if you were to say, pick the worst way to deal with the environmental situation we're going into, that would be it. But yet, that's in fact not the dominant form, but it's quite dominant. And so, in that context, we said, and we say this in Jakarta all the time, it's a tropical paradise with 17,000 islands and many lovely cities. Why do you come here? There's not, it's probably, it'll be 40 million in, in the next few years. Why would you possibly come here? But yet, 80% of the GDP goes to this. And so this, this question of, of economic inequality and the radical asymmetries of the city to countryside produced this form, right? And, and, uh, um, and in this sense, I completely agree with you. I would point to one example and then ask one other question. The example is a colleague, uh, Daisy Tan, at uh, University of Hong Kong, who adopted our software to do uh, food security and redistribution of food resources 
uh, in Hong Kong because there's actually a lot of hunger, there's a lot of food need, um, but it's also there's a tremendous problem of scarcity because Hong Kong imports really everything. And so if you have a bad storm or a few boats can't come in or what, it can very quickly produce a very, very precarious situation despite the tremendous affluence, right? So even a city like Hong Kong can be shut off in a matter of days where there's literally no food. Um, and so they've been working on the version of Cognicity that's essentially doing food logistics with, with our platform. And this has raised a number of really interesting questions, both about long-term food security and about the engagement of building out more meaningful connections between the city and the, and the supply chain, in a sense, that, that make that a sustainable set of relationships. And I, and I mean, I think there's a, can have a long conversation after this about the importance of that form of, of recognizing the metabolic risk, as Marx calls it, as it is, and how would we begin to heal it in meaningful ways. And I think there are a number of platforms that are also trying to put our attention to that. La última pregunta. Thank you so much for this uh, really interesting talk. Um, so I'm an anthropologist and a civil engineer studying flooding in Mexico City. So in some ways, I feel that, uh, that there's a lot of similarities between what we talked about in Jakarta. I'd love to talk even more about them. But I think there's also a tension that maybe I face from my indoctrination as a civil engineer of trying to build big things and fix, things, fix problems and sort of modernist vision. And what I see on the ground with people as well, you know, I study both engineers and, and residents. And I wonder, you know, look at, you know, in the case of Mexico City, the budget for water has been declining for such a long, or it's stag you know, stagnant related to the, the needs. I mean, I did the calculation that it's 20 times less than the budget of Seattle, which is where I'm from, and the city is, you know, 16 times bigger. I mean, it's something absurd. And so, to what extent are we, do we conflate in this Anthropocene that, you know, oh, it's really big challenges, you know, you know right, climate change is going to bring things we've never seen, and, but at the same time, in the same period of time, we're seeing budgets that have, are keep going down, I mean, people eat, you know, uh, budgets keep diminishing. And so, I mean, and then I think about, you know, adaptation versus, um, you know, trying to actually, in some ways, fix the problem. I mean, if, maybe this problem can't be fixed. Maybe we're always going to flood to some extent. But, you know, there's a part of me that says, well, why, you know, I think you're saying that, you know, it's not just, they all just need ropes, they also need something else. And then that also is another question I have to do with some of the limits of residential epistemology, because there are things that, you know, Mexico City drainage system, I can tell you all about it, it's very complicated, and, and most people can't understand it fully. And yet, at the same time, we should be teaching them and bringing them in, in. But, you know, how do you deal with that friction between what, you know, a resident might say, yeah, they can build me a bigger tube, and that tube just floats somebody else, you know, so those sorts of challenges. Uh, that, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, look, I think that in the end, there's there's no there's no te there's no kind of test that's going to be like this this should be fixed, and this we can like ad hoc this a little you know. Um, obviously, the neoliberal pillage of all of our governments everywhere has led to a complete absence of any investment in any public infrastructure at all. I mean. The, 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 like, no one's paying for anything, and everyone's coasting on the fumes of the previous investment in public infrastructure. That's going to come to a head, and the people who live in cities are going to see that, like, it's way better when you can flush the toilet than when you can't. Um, but I think that asks a number of much bigger questions around um, the sort of government, government by capital as opposed to government by government. Um, now, on the question of, like, look, I want the people who make the ropes to have more access to resources, but I also don't think that we should be espousing a future where everyone in the world gets to have the carbon footprint of someone from Texas. Um, that's not progress. Um, and I think our, our complete obsession with development and progress has put us in a position where the idea of an improvement in the quality of one's life is the increase in one's carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And that we need to do both of those things. Um, and that again comes back to the density of relationships, 
how can people live better uh, with much less requirements. Uh, interestingly, on this point, we took the survey of livability that my colleagues did in the city of Sydney in Australia and did it in like one of the poorest kampongs in Jakarta. And the people in the poorest kampongs in Jakarta are like way happier than the richest people in Sydney, which is no surprise to anyone who's been to Australia. <laughs> but, um, no offense. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but but it's like wow, all the livability metrics, walkability, care for your kids, close to work, like network, neighborhood network, ability to respond to this and this, it's all there, but it's not capitalized in the way it needs to be. A lot of the questions of the ad, which systems of ad hoc are are okay and which kind of should be paid attention to so people don't die in a terrible fire or you know, basic forms of public health. Um, but again, this comes back to the lab ladies. It's like, we have ways of encouraging people to behave better that's like your neighbor kind of making you feel bad. That's way more efficient than paying a German company to spay, spray insecticides on the children. And so I think that like paying attention to how we guide those forms of investment and really interrogating you know, everyone believes that there's someone somewhere who knows the cost of that insecticide in relation to human life and other forms of urban life. What did we find in our study? This is for a civil engineer, I'll give you a good one. So these engineers, like this guy, come and they say you have to spray this much and this cracks and you know, you, you saw the image, yeah? What did we not expect to find in this? That for every time that is sprayed, any mosquito that survives, its children can tolerate that chemical. Which means that, like our overuse of antibiotics, our overuse of urban insecticides produces then a, essentially a time bomb of dengue coming at us, which all engineers in the city say is necessary, but which if we just step back for a moment and say, yeah, but the exponential rate of mosquito reproduction and dengue reproduction inside those mosquitoes means that if we do this 10,000 more times, we're all gonna die. Um, like, run that, run that model, right? And so I think the question is not to dismiss kind of civil engineering questions, but to contextualize them in terms of all of the other factors that are converging. And if we start to think of the cost of concrete against the cost of water, we start to think of the cost of fogging against the cost of hospitalization, if we start to actually have a more robust social and environmental accounting process, then there's a lot for, for engineering and anthropology and all of our backgrounds to, to give to this, but the conversation has to be much more diverse. And we can't pretend that like mesquite, like dengue is a problem that lives inside of a mosquito Therefore, if I kill a mosquito, I beat dengue. Like, it was so caveman shit. Like, cavemen are not that stupid. And so, how did we end up in a place where we wage war one thing at a time? And this is like, completely lost her mind, you know? And so, I, I would say, like, that's where the, the limit of residential epistemology is like, when we're so attentive to everything, we can't make a decision. But that's a long way on the other side of where we are now, spraying poison on our children, hoping that it'll keep them from getting sick. Bravo. La última y nos vamos, ¿no? Una última pregunta, por favor. Los últimos. No, please on the on the microphone because we. No, please don't. That's the thing. <laughs> Uh, hi, I, I'm really interested in what you were saying about, you know, how to have this collective intelligence all together and especially how to make different stakeholders work together in this minimal, viable, caring. Yeah. Uh, and as you come from MIT, I would like to ask you about the youth, the theory, youth theory from Otto Scharmer. Have you heard? No. You haven't heard about it. Okay, but I saw you draw it. Yeah, so. this is the one. And actually, it comes, you know, it goes down, but it comes on the way up. It uses design thinking. Okay. 
So, okay, I'm just giving an example because you know some people are using it, right. using this methodology, and even other Sean, but we actually do have them using it. And I have a friend that is working around the diabetes, mm -hmm. a, a, a child, child diabetes in Brazil, and putting all together this. So, if not the, the youth theory, can you give us some example and some methodology or some framing or some, I don't know, some philosophy around how to, to create this trust environment? Wow. Okay. Um, so, um, just quick correction. I was a research scientist at MIT for a few years, and I'm no longer there, but I do appreciate um, the valuable PR that that institution gave to a lot of our work. <laughs> uh, but um, let me just say two things about that. One is that I am grateful that you guys entertained these neologisms that we're trying to work through, particularly the anastrophic and the residential epistemology. Um, and as a philosopher, I, I have a lot of distaste for people just making up words so that they sound like they're talking about something new and everyone knows that that thing has been what we're talking about all along. And so I really try to bring that to bear on my own writing of not saying, not making up words when existing words are entirely sufficient to describe that thing. Um, and in the case of this book, Software for the City Yet to Come, um, the anastrophic question and this question around theatricality and participation this is really trying to do some concept work that we feel isn't done by other things, although it does traffic in resilience and other similar discourses. Um, and similarly on the residential epistemology side. But one of the things we try to do is say, like, does our work require new concepts to describe what we're doing? And only in the case where we really don't feel like it can follow in, you know, we don't, we don't have so much time to be developing the theory of the work because we're really busy doing a lot of the work. But when we do want to intervene in that context, we are trying to develop concepts that maybe represent things that are not coming out of MIT, United States, or Europe, and that might be relevant for other people thinking about cities in non-dominant cultural space. Um, and the, the other thing that I would just say about, about theory and like what, what to put to work, we, we talked about this in the interview about Mars. Um, we do bring a lot of philosophy to, to the practice um, and, but in a, very, in a very precise way, which is to say that um, our motivation for doing this work is not to make cool technology, and it's not to like be on fucking Wired magazine. It's because the problems that we see and the ways we want to live better with people in the places where we live and be able to care about people better than we do now, require us to make things together. And I think as a kind of, as a kind of species that's pretty good at making stuff together, um, and we've made like lots of stuff, we've made cities. Cities are completely fucking crazy things to make. Um, but like how to keep in the process of like making together without, um, losing the direction of why we want to do that in a way relies on, I think, on a lot of philosophy. But I, I, do, I do think that being attentive to both the joy and the cruelty of living in a city and finding ways to celebrate and respect both of those things um, would slow down a lot of urban design and software design, but it would also make it a lot better. And so I just want to say really grateful, amazing questions and thank you guys for, for hanging out. This is an incredible space. I heard they're hiring. I may even try to just get back and just stick around. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. And and just thank you again to the translators and to um, to the tech 
labor. Uh, thank you for making it live. Well, muchísimas gracias a ti, Mariana, todo el equipo del CCB, el equipo del laboratorio que apoyo, efectivamente la traducción afra, y gracias a todos ustedes por, por asistir. Esperamos que sea la primera, o la más bien la segunda plática de varias por venir contigo, Etienne, aunque no entiendas lo que estoy diciendo. Gracias a todos.